Thank you very much, Professor Todd. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, last year, uh, during June and July, I was in China, Peking University, so I couldn't be here. Uh, but it's always a pleasure to be here. The title tonight, After the Crisis, Growth and Exchange Rates in the G20. And I will talk more, not just about Europe. I was in Washington yesterday. They set me in a seat with an air conditioner coming to me, I hear nothing on this side, so <laughs> I'll hear from the other side. Anyway, the topics uh, that I will uh, examine, we have to go back quickly, at least, to the causes of the global, global financial crisis. Then we go on on the, why recovery is so slow in advanced country, but growth is rapid in emerging markets. Then there are the structural problems. Beyond that crisis, there are underlying forces, and these are the structural problems, which lead uh, us to discuss uh, about exchange rates and un sustainable trade deficits, then the crisis in the Eurozone, and then a bit more forward-looking, medium, long-term on growth in the, very, in the G20. Now, if we look at the causes, first of all, first of all, we know, it's been said, this is the most, uh, the most uh, uh, serious or the first global financial crisis of this century, but the most serious crisis since the Great Depression. And let me say something. Nouriel Roubini predicted nothing. Everything I say here, I said it to him, and I say it, I say it in print. So I'm not saying anything in the absence of the person. Uh, Nouriel Roubini says he predicted the crisis. Six months ago, I told him in front of a 1,000 people, you predicted nothing. Because to make a prediction, you must tell me the timing and the reason. That is, when the crisis comes and why. If you miss one or the other or both, you predicted nothing. You cannot tell me a, a crisis will come. As day follows night, eventually we'll have crises. You have to tell me why, when, and why. And so Rubini, in 2004, said a crisis is imminent. On my dictionary, imminent doesn't mean today, doesn't mean next week, but is with, certainly within a few months. Half a, half, half a year. And he said the reason for the crisis would be the dollar would collapse, interest rates would rise in the US, the US would go into recession and bring the world into recession with itself. A crisis that was possible then, a crisis that is possible now, but it is not the reason for the crisis. In 2006, he repeated, a crisis is imminent. This time, the reason was the sharp increase in commodity prices. And of course, the crisis didn't come. Then in 2007, at the end of 2007, <laughs> at the dawn, you could tell it's, a, it's a, a cloudy day, he says the crisis will come from the, uh, the uh, housing market, when most of us knew. It's as if, as if, suppose in 2008 I had said the crisis will be over. Perfect per prediction. But if I don't say when and how, I have predicted nothing. So I say this because now he goes around, he gets $40,000, uh, not that I'm envious, $40,000 honoraria, and that doesn't mean, I mean, it's really unbelievable. I don't blame him, I play those who pay him. And you know how many times he predicted double dip since 2008? The worst is yet to come? Anyway, but that's what we have to keep in mind. We know what the causes are, uh, were, subprime, banks, uh, uh, Savings and Loans Association, Faye Ma uh, Faye, uh, May Faye, uh, and Freddie Mac, gave mortgages to people who could not afford at interest rates which were variable when they were the lowest in 50 years. And it was, didn't require much intelligence to know that families would not be able to sustain those mortgages. So why did they give those mortgages? Because they knew they would resell these mortgages to the investment banks. And the investment bank bought those mortgages because they, they repackaged with other financial instruments, sold it over the wide market, and they thought by so doing, the risk would disappear. Then you had the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, rating agencies, which gave AAA ratings. And it was uh, a conflict of interest. You don't give me AAA, I'll go to another agency. So AAA. And then, of course, the Security and Exchange Commission was asleep at the wheel. Uh, Cox was 
uh, and he showed it at, uh, in Congress when he uh, um, uh, uh, gave a testimony in front of that he was completely incompetent. So if I had to say to people who are not economists, more down to earth, which are the causes of the crisis? Number one, there was uh, uh, inadequate, inadequate regulations. The commercial banking sector was well regulated, but the crisis didn't come from there. It came from the, from the investment banks, which were not well regulated. We're not in favor of too much regulation. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we understand, but there has to be some rules uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the game. Uh, secondly, those, those regulations that existed were not applied. Thirdly, greed. Profits are all costs. And fourthly, fourthly, uh, was fraud that Madoff made $65 billion disappear. I was, after this happened, I was in Serbia, a country not the poorest in the world, with 8 million people, and the GDP of Serbia was $44 billion. So Madoff made $65 billion disappear. That's a wonderful <laughs> act to, to follow. But now comes Europe, and I have one foot here, one foot there. Uh, Europe blames the U.S. for the crisis. Well, the crisis started here. The spark started here. However, and they don't like when I say this, but we have to judge. We're not here to please or to say whatever the, the truth is or just get a, a response. If Europe had not committed more excesses, the banking sector and the housing sector than the United States, the crisis would not have come to Europe as quickly and as, pro as deeply as it did. And this is some evidence for those who don't want to. When Lehman Brothers went out of business, the leverage, the, me the measure of risk going from zero to 100, was 31. For Citibank, Citigroup or Citicorp, uh, the largest of the banks in the US in trouble, the uh, leverage was 38. The UBS Swiss was 42. Deutsche Bank was 56. At one point, Deutsche Bank had said this uh, leverage was 25. I said, how did you measure that? They used only the leverage in the commercial banking sector. No, like so after we got through with it, it was 56. And Barclays, 63. The 20 largest, the 12 largest banks in the US, the weighted average uh, leverage was 20 for European 35. So European banks committed even more excesses than American banks. And that's one reason why the crisis came and came very quickly. You cannot see well. I don't like the figures that are not to see or tables which are too big. But this is the long-run trend in housing prices. This is 1997. Then this is, uh, this is Ireland, this is the UK, this is Spain, and this is the US. In other words, in those three other countries, the housing bubble was even greater than in the US. And notice, in the US, the decline from 206 to 211 in housing prices, the weighted average was 32%. And still, it doesn't mean that it has to go to this long-run trend, but it's still not there. And we may still suffer some additional. So Europe committed even more excesses in the banking sector, more excesses in the, uh, in the housing sector, and that's the reason for the crisis. Yes, the spark came from here, but they were, in a sense, they were as guilty. And so this is, uh, uh, this is what happened quickly. The US GDP fell by 2.6%. In 2009, it did not grow fast, uh, 206 and 209, it grew 2.9% in 210. Remember, this is a deep recession. The other similar deep recession was 1981-82. And for five quarters, subsequent to the, the depth of the recession, GDP, real GDP, grew at, at an average of 7.5%. So in two years, we recuperated all of the jobs lost plus others. This time, this is nothing to write home about, 2.9, enough. And we know the unemployment rate, which is slightly going up. But if you counted the discouraged workers, the rate of unemployment would not be 9.2%, it would be 11, 12%. And if we counted youth unemployment or discouraged or part-time workers, it would be much more. The euro area was even deeper, and the growth was even less. Even Germany says the, the, the more, the Ger GDP fell 4.7%. And in 2010, it increased 3.5%. It did not even recuperate what it lost in 2009. And look at uh, Japan, 6.3 decline, 4% growth. And now it is still in, or it fell back into, uh, into recession. And this tells us 
uh, more or less. This is uh, the United States. The depth was not as, as, as deep. This is the European Union. Uh, this is uh, 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 Japan. And the growth has been a little higher, but again, nothing adequate for us to uh, be happy or to reduce uh, unemployment. So this is, now, this is what happened in Europe. How did the crisis come? You see, we need theory and we need facts. Without theory, it's like entering a dark room and looking for the switch. Sometimes we say useful things without even realizing it. Sometimes we say foolish things and we don't even realize. We don't find the switch right away. So we need theory. But sometimes economists are so proud not to know the real world. They're pure theoreticians. But to deal with the real world, we also have to know the real world because often it doesn't work like theory postulates. So we need to know theory. We need to know the real world. And we need a little common sense which some of our colleagues certainly do not have. One of them is Paul Krugman. I mean, he's, uh, 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 in 2002, he said the US is going to go back into recession, double dip, in, uh, which didn't happen. In 2003, he repeated, the US is going to go into recession. I wrote an article that says, at this rate, he's bound to be right as day follows night. And I don't blame him for making that. Again, I blame those people who pay him so handsomely so, uh, to hear stupidities. And I, and I said this in print. I say nothing here that I don't say elsewhere. So the point is, why? Well, he knows the theory, but he's slanted. He's slanted in one way. You see, I compete with him. And I tell him, Paul, you are wonderful. Not really. But uh, uh, there are a few things I can do better than you. And he doesn't like that. I outsell him. My text all over the world. I'm the defender of the faith. Because he goes in extreme ways. Uh, actual lean isn't worth anything. Uh, the Moldell Fleming model is nothing. The offer curve uh, cannot be measured. Therefore, we don't have to deal with it. And without them, we cannot measure the optimum tariff. In his text, he goes, as you increase the tariff without retaliation, you improve up to a point. That's the optimum tariff. And then if you keep increasing, the benefits goes down. That's not measured. That's not a measure. But again, I'm not here to defend him. The only reason for bringing him in is because he's one of the pessimists who always see dark and therefore and unbalanced in many, many ways. And that's one reason he got the Nobel also, one reason for being unbalanced on one side. But anyway, how did the crisis go? That's why you need theory. How did the crisis go to emerging markets? Well, they were not responsible this time, but it went through the real sector, and therefore came with a lag about six months to a year, to a year later. And how did it come? Well, the blue line is the real GDP, world GDP, which was declined, awaited the world GDP in the first quarter of 2009, but over 2% while trade declined by over 9%. These were a great deal the exports of emerging markets. So when their exports declined because uh, advanced countries were in a crisis, they, the crisis spread to them through the real sector, which happens a little uh, uh, with, a, with a lag. And this is the net private financial flows to emerging markets. In 2006, 2006 there were $300 billion from advanced to emerging markets, which is a stimulus to their growth. In 2007, 2008, it went to 2007, 700 billion, but then went down to 200. So now, emerging markets exporting less because advanced countries were not growing and receiving less foreign investments from advanced countries, the crisis spread to them. And this is what happened in, advanced, in emerging markets. Oh no, first is, uh, well, this is, uh, uh, this is the world, this is uh, advanced countries, and these are emerging markets. Uh, the world went deeper into recession than emerging markets, and then uh, the world is uh, emerging markets are growing faster than advanced countries, and this is the average for the world. But this is what happened to growth. There is one missing. Oh, yes, this is it. This is what happened to growth. China growing at 9, 10, which seems unbelievable rates of growth, and they are, because at 10%, it doubles real GDP every seven years, 7.2 years to be precise. But people don't realize that the way we look at those growth rates are different than we look at those growth rates for advanced countries. 
10% growth for China is like 4% growth for Germany. The reason is China needs at least five, six percentage points of growth in order to absorb the still 400, 500 million people who live in subsistence agriculture into the market system. So they need at least 6%. 6% for them would be like zero for us. So 10% is something really spectacular, but it has to be viewed in this way. India. India, we were embarrassed. The largest democracy in the world that didn't grow, while China, Let's not forget, still a communist dictatorship. I'm a professor at Peking University now. And, when I, and then I went to South Africa. When the South African sent me an email saying, well, as soon as you come, we want to interview a, your national television, all of my emails stopped from China. Hundreds of emails, dear professor, all blanked out. They were not targeting me, but they have a filter. Anything that smacks of interview television, Egypt at the time was happening, you suddenly, you stop everything. I've done it to them. We had a delegation of uh, business people, high level business people coming to the United States. And as the date was approaching for me to talk, they were sending me emails and I wasn't responding. And they were very worried. And I said, well, I treat your emails the same as I treat the other emails which I don't receive. Okay? I mean, this is a, so, I mean, I don't receive others, I receive yours, but I treat them the same way because I know that where it's happening and why. So, India, we were embarrassed that India was not growing. Now, India found a way to grow rapidly. India grew rapidly when the, uh, agriculture did well and not when agriculture did not, that, did not do well. Now, it's growing rapidly. Then you have Russia. Well, Yeltsin, uh, 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 Putin is as democratic as an, I'm an Eskimo. If Russia did not export uh, uh, raw materials and so on, Russia's growth would be 1%, not 4%. And it's not going anywhere if it, except for that. Brazil, Lula used to say to Europe, I was there once, and he says, invest in Brazil, the nation of the future. Look how rapidly we're growing. Well, uh, this, the average for these two is less than 4%. And this is 4%. For Brazil, 4% is like 1% for us. Again, nothing to write home. The potential is there, but not yet been realized. Brazil is always a country of the future. We hope the future has arrived, but not at these growth rates. But now we come closer home. The reason for saying that all of this is that many people believe the crisis, the financial crisis, somehow is not over. That's why we are not growing. That crisis is over, but that crisis occurred in the background of structural imbalances which prevent us from growing now, and those we have to focus on, because those are the problems that do not respond to monetary fiscal policy as we have seen. But this is a financial crisis we know, we know, are deeper and, uh, are deeper and last longer than uh, other crises, like the 1981-82 was a real sector. You know, you have excesses, you have a crisis, and you eliminate the excesses, uh, or you correct the excesses to go back. But this recession not only is a financial recession in the financial sector, but it is in the context, in the background, of big structural disequilibria. And those, that, those are the reasons why we and other advanced countries don't grow so much. We also don't grow so much, and don't lynch me, although here I think I'm safe to say, uh, that uh, Obama and Clinton say, we want to be more like Europe. We don't want to be more like Europe. This is the United States. This is the country of opportunities, which gave us the reason for much higher growth. You want to be like Europe? Most of us came here for that reason. We don't want to be, unless, uh, uh, but there are, obviously, if we make policies the same as in Europe, we will become like Europe. This we will see is perhaps what's, got, what's happening. So we have un, uh, the unsustainable US and Eurozone trade deficits with China, we will see. These are the major structural imbalance, but it is the evidence, is the tip of the iceberg. They are due to other structural problems. And these trade deficits we'll see are due to misaligned exchange rates, China keeping the exchange rate undervalued, and the savings and investment imbalance. We don't save too much. China does not invest enough at home for reasons that we will see. And so, without, I don't like, as I said, big tables, but just look. 
These are the trade deficits of the United States, the excess of imports over exports. And this was 6.5% of GDP. This declined to 36 but this is 4.5% of GDP. We know that anything above 2-3% deficit is unsustainable in the longer, medium long run. But notice, it's not so much, this is certainly a problem, 47% of our deficit is with a single country, China. Now, there is no theory that postulates that we have to balance our trade bilaterally. But when F of our uh, uh, deficit is with a single country, something is amiss. Something is amiss. And the next are monthly figures, which show even worse. These, are, this is the total US trade deficit. And this, you cannot see much, but this is with China alone. This is 55%. In this month, in the middle of 2010, 55% of our deficit, the US trade deficit, was with a single country. Again, no law, no theory postulates that we have to balance bilaterally. But when one country alone is responsible, and I'm not blaming necessarily China on this, something is, something is amiss. And this is, it started as a joke, the hamburger standard. These are overvaluations or undervaluation of the dollar in relation to various countries. According to that, the United States dollar is overvalued in relation to the Chinese currency by 40%. This means, not it's like, this it's as if China imposed an import tariff against American exports of 40% and gave a subsidy to its exports to the United States. This is protectionism. You can have protectionism by tariffs and subsidies, or you can have it by keeping your currency undervalued. Okay? And this is not my view. I say this in China. I say because, and if, so there is an under, under uh, valuation of the Chinese currency. In other words, they have an unfair advantage of 40%. If you're an exporter, you, have, you face a 40% disadvantage. The, the field is not leveled. The playing field is not leveled. And this is what happened to the Chinese currency. Now, again, we don't have to be experts. Frankly, when economists speak to non-economists, most of you are, there's something wrong if the non-economists cannot understand. This is a social science. They have to understand. Otherwise, we're not doing our job. We cannot take refuge toward the equations. I've done most or many of the ILE technical, but we also have to be able to discuss more broadly. This is China's currency. It's an inverted scale. So an increase means the yuan or the mbimbi, the Chinese currency, is appreciating. So between July uh, 2005 and March 2008, when the crisis began, uh, the Chinese currency, China, allowed its currency to appreciate about 22%. Then the crisis came. The currency st stood still. Now it resumed its appreciation another 5%. Okay? So there has been, but now comes theory, and you have Chinese economists, European economists, American economists, who say the greatest stupidity. Look at this. Now, this is, these are the trade deficit of the United States in relation to China, 203 to 208. The U.S. trade deficit with China have increased. At the same time that the Chinese currency has appreciated when the Chinese currency appreciates, this should lower U.S. deficits. When the currency of China appreciates, it means our exports become cheaper to them and our trade deficit should be lower. Instead, it increased. So they say the exchange rate has no effect on trade. This is completely wrong because theory also postulates that when the exchange rate changes with a lag, it will affect the trade balance. So in other words, the China currency appreciated and eventually the US trade deficit with China was declining. That's, so first, they do not know that you change the exchange rate and the effect comes with a year or two lag. And it, do, it did. But then there is something else. 
you have to do, suppose that at the same time as China currency appreciates, there are other factors which tend to increase the US trade deficit. So now, even if the Chinese currency appreciates, if there are other factors that increase the US trade deficit, the US trade deficit increases as opposed to what one would predict. That's why we have to do counterfactual simulation. What would have been the US trade deficit without this appreciation? And from rough counterfactual simulation, it shows that as the, US, the Chinese currency appreciates with a lag, the US trade deficit will decline. And if the Chinese currency had not appreciated, these deficits would have been even bigger. So theory works, okay? It's not a, uh, not, uh, so people say, uh, so people say, silly. but then there is, we go deeper. You see, a misaligned exchange rate is the tip of the iceberg. So first you have a US trade deficit, which is based by Chinese currency being undervalued. But the Chinese currency is undervalued because of more upstream, basic, fundamental imbalances. And this is the imbalance. The United States saves in two, saved in 2010 11.6%. Not families. Families will see. We're practically not saving, and now they are beginning to save again. And these are investments. In other words, the savings of the private sector and the total savings of the United States were low in, in relation to the investment opportunities. So when you have investment opportunities and you don't save enough, there is an inflow of capital. The inflow of capital means you have to exchange the foreign currency into dollars. The demand for dollars increases. The dollar appreciates and leads to a trade deficit. So in other words, the US saves too little, but they are big or they were big investment opportunities, so it attracts capital. This appreciates the dollar, which then leads to a trade deficit. And this, and notice who is the supplier of these, uh, who are the suppliers of these savings? Primarily China. Incredible that a poor country saves 54% seems impossible. But there is a reason. China has no unemployment insurance. It has no pension, no health services. You have to pay for everything. If you have to pay for everything, you have to save. Well, we save through uh, uh, in our uh, deduction in our, uh, they don't yet or not much. So they have to save a great deal. They want to buy a house. They want to, they have to retire. They become unemployed. They have to, uh, for education, they have to. And notice, they invest much less. So this now is the problem. It's not that China is saving too much if they're willing to sacrifice to invest but it's very difficult to invest in China. The financial sector is not well developed. So now the only thing they can do or, is to buy apartments and so on, and that leads to a housing bubble. Now, uh, and I know something, I've written for those who are interested uh, in the China Review, which is the leading journal in China, in December 2010, seven months ago, I have an article on the Chinese financial sector, which is increasing, expanding, become deeper, very rapidly, they have a long way to go, but it's not adequate yet to absorb all of their uh, in, uh, savings. And so it goes. First, it, it participated or c contributed to the housing bubble, then to the commodity, to the commodity uh, uh, bubble. Uh, and uh, uh, so it is, uh, and now, the purchase of gold and properties. People used to say, and maybe uh, China used to say, I'm accumulating so many dollars. They are useless, these green pieces of paper, useless. They are buying property all over the world. They're not useless. They're not useless things. They, go, they ask South Africa to become a member of BRICS, that is Brazil, Russia, India, and China. South Africa is four times smaller than the, smaller, the smallest of the other four BRICS, Russia. And there is Indonesia, there is Korea who belongs there. But China is shrewd. It wants a foothold in Africa. So it wanted South Africa as a foothold to go all over, all over Africa. And they are buying all of the textile industry of South Africa and Nigeria is owned by China. So when Chinese used to say, we are accumulating too many dollars, these are useless. Now they realize that these green pieces of paper are not useless. They buy property all over the world. Mind you, I'm not accusing China. I mean, China does its business and it grows fast, works hard, saves a great deal, 
very laborious, they deserve the benefit. What I'm saying is some of that benefit comes at our expense. And that's, but we, I don't blame them. I blame us for allowing this to happen. I mean, you know, you want to be good, but you, take, you bring water to your, uh, to your side. So this is uh, what is, uh, uh, so now, we save too little, we receive capital, the dollar appreciates, leads to a trade deficit. China saves as much as uh, a sacrifice. It cannot invest at home all of this, invests in the US, accumulates dollars, which that, then I use to go into to buy European, <laughs> I wonder how safe those are, but, uh, and property, real property. But notice something else. This is the nominal exchange rate. The one is appreciating. But notice from June to, the, to November, December, it appreciates nominally only by 2%, two percentage point. But the real, since inflation is higher in China than in the United States, the real exchange rate, the one, the currency of China is appreciating much faster in real terms than the nominal rate. So now, how much is the China uh, currency undervalued in relation to the dollar? Say now 30%? Well, this is six percentage points. Another three and a half years at this rate, and the currency will go into equilibrium. Also, also, the United States is, uh, this is personal savings, 2%. Individuals, say families, 2%, 3%. Now, this was up to, nine, up to the crisis. Now, they are beginning to say 5 6%. The usual is between 7 and 11. So now, China's inflation is higher, which means that their currency is appreciating much faster in real terms than the nominal rate. And if it continues another three years, there's no reason to continue, but if it continues another three years, it will eliminate the undervaluation of the one. Also, the US is saving more, therefore needing less capital. We hope also with the budget, de the, uh, uh, the budget deficit and so on. And China is beginning to invest more at home and save less. So there is a natural tendency toward uh, the elimination. At the same time, at the same time, these structural fundamental problems are on the way of being corrected, but if then those forces are not allowed to operate to allow the one to appreciate, which China did not do until now, but now allowing to control inflation to some extent. So we are in the process of, uh, of over overcoming uh, the problem. But now we go to Europe. And of course, I was supposed to be at the Mondel conference, and then my mother, who's 96, never stops a minute, suddenly had the false alarm two days before I had to go, so I didn't go. Uh, but, uh, and the conference talked precisely on this. Now, this is the exchange rate. How many dollars do we need to buy a euro? It started at $1.17. It went down to 82 cents in September 2000. Then it went to $1.60 in January 2008, and now it's about $1.40. Now, is the euro overvalued in relation to the dollar? Well, we don't know exactly what the equilibrium rate is, but if you go between 80, 80 cents and $1.60, and you find some kind of an average, we know that the exchange rate, the equilibrium exchange rate between the dollar and the euro should be between $1.20 and $1.30. Being $1.40, the euro is overvalued, overvalued in relation to the dollar, which is overvalued in relation to the one. And therefore, the euro is that much more overvalued in relation to the one. And this is what's happening to Europe. Those bars, the red bars, are the trade deficit of the United States vis-a-vis -vis China. The blue bars are the trade deficit of Europe in the euro area zone in relation to China. So now Europe has as much of an unsustainable trade deficit as the United States, and they deserve it. The reason is I was part of a delegation. I went to Europe with a US delegation to talk to Trichet two years ago saying, we have a, a, a non-level playing field. Help us to convince China to revalue because the currency is undervalued. We're not saying anything against China. The currency is undervalued. Trichet said, we don't want any troubles with China. It's your problem. So when Americans, the other Americans left, I wasn't born here, but now I'm American. When the other, I said, I cannot speak for the delegation, 
But you know what's going to happen now to Trichet and Papademos, the rice? Mm -hmm. We believe in the markets. Believing in the markets, we have an unsustainable trade deficit. Therefore, we allow the dollar to fluctuate. We don't like fluctuation, but we allow the dollar to fluctuate. And therefore, the dollar has to depreciate. It cannot depreciate with regard to the, US, to the Chinese currency and so on. It will depreciate against the euro, which has no fault for the American deficit. And therefore, you will pay the consequences. Suddenly, suddenly, after two years delay, they realized. Brazil say, we're a major country. We will not follow the United States. What I say, that's silly. You have to look at the policy suggestion. It may be in your interest. We used to say, Brazil also's currency is 30% overvalued. Brazil competes with China on world markets. And its currency is overvalued in relation to the dollar and even more with relation. So now, two years later, the brilliant, the brilliant economists and politicians realize, you see, you play in advance, not with a lag. You know, you, you, play, you anticipate to do the correct policy, not afterwards. Afterwards is, uh, is too late. So Europe deserves what it gets. And it is in trouble because its currency is grossly overvalued. And they have, just like the US, an unsustainable trade deficit. But now we go to the Eurozone. We go to the Eurozone and we see uh, a dollar, uh, a euro overvalued and low international competitiveness of Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and Italy in that order of problems. Unsustainable budget deficits and sovereign debt of, I don't like pigs, P-I-I-G-S. Pigs, Portugal, Ireland. Uh, no, let's go the other way. Uh, Gibbs, Gibbsy, you know, Greece, because that's where the problem is. It's Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and Italy in that order. Okay, so let's not uh, uh, insult and be uh, constructive, right? So now we face either default in some countries like Greece, stagnation, some countries leaving the euro. Well, this is the problem in Europe. Anyone who thinks that Greece, first of all, Greece has to learn to live within its means. Greece had lived 40, 50% above. In other words, wages in Greece were far out as not justified by productivity. People retired in Greece at 57 with a pension higher than in Germany. What should we do? Germany has to pay for their pension. And now they have uh, you know, uh, all sorts of uh, uh, demonstrations in the streets. What do they want? They are living beyond their means. And anyone who, who, uh, loaned, uh, to Greece, who loaned to Greece, they better forget about getting those loans. Those are losses. And notice Germany and France. First, they have to live within their means. Then suddenly, they realize that the banks that lent to Greece were French and German. So now they're in favor of helping Greece because by so doing, they're helping their own banks. And the French and German banks lend to Greece knowing perfectly well that they were cooking the books. They said perfectly well that they were not able to pay, but they were earning high interest knowing that when they got in trouble, the governments, said they would come to their help to prevent another major, major crisis. So they played the game well, and they wanted to continue to play the game. So Moody was bad, and uh, 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 the, the, the rating agency. So now it said, the way you want to help Greece is really a default, and call it a default. If something walks like a chicken, chips and flies like a chicken, is a chicken, okay? And therefore, they don't like Moody now anymore, but it is forcing them to acknowledge that they have to, in other words, what they would want to do is extend the loans at high interest rates for 30 years. Well, Greece will never come out of the, of the crisis. Uh, so this is the increase uh, in wages or cost of labor, per unit of labor. If you start with an index of 100 in all countries, this is Germany. The cost per unit of labor between 2000 and 2009 was less than 2%. This is Spain. This is Ireland, and this is Greece. Costs, it com completely, uh, in other words, Germany, productivity increases, they can increase wages without increasing costs. In these countries, any increase in wages is an increase in cost because productivity doesn't grow. So they're completely out of competitiveness. This is Italy, 
This is Portugal, this is, uh, Portugal, this is France, and this is Germany. So now, their costs are completely out of whack. They want wage increases which exceed productivity, and therefore costs per unit of labor rise, they are not justified, and they lose competitiveness. I was in Italy on national television, and I gave them between the eyes. When Fiat said, we want a labor contract, the labor union said, this is exploitation. I said on national television, I don't know who your economists are, or who are the labor unions, because I read the contracts of Volkswagen, Mercedes, GM, Toyota, and all of them are very similar to what Fiat is asking. So you are telling me that this is exploitation? Tell me you don't want to work anymore. Italy grew faster than any other country in the world except Japan between 1950 and 1970. And it was the miracle. Then they stopped working. It seems today that the worst thing you can do to a human being is make him work. And that is incredible. We have a plant in southern Italy which is identical to the plant in Turin. It produces 40% less. People who are blind who drive, people who are uh, uh, absentees. And I say, you know, your salary should be not 40% less, 50% less, because you don't allow the firm to operate capital efficiently. So suddenly I become an exploit. <laughs> oh, come on. You people deserve what you are getting. And until maybe you deserve a deep crisis to understand that we have to earn our living. We, d we want to help people in need, but you cannot live at my expense. And yes, I earned over $250,000, and Mr. Obama, I'm not a criminal, because half, that's how much I earn outside. And if you tax me, people don't believe this. Do you know the marginal tax rate when Reagan became president? 77%, 78%. So if I earned $1,000 more, I would have to give $780 to the government. I'll go fishing. I don't have to work. And where do I pay my taxes? Where do I spend the $200,000, $300,000 I earn abroad? In this country. I will go fishing. So you find out, my friend, if I'm a criminal by working this much, okay? So now there are people who take uh, offense to what I say. I know what I'm saying, it, but I say this elsewhere, even on the other side. You see, a conservative, um, a, 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 a conservative who's a mediocre conservative becomes an extreme right. And a leftist all the way is a moderate. Oh, really? Come on, come on, let's, let's consult. Let's have a debate. Okay, and, uh, and don't stop me. You have your say, I have my say. I wrote a book with Fred Campana, which was regarded as the best book on income distribution. So I respond to a Krugman in the New York Times. It will not publish. Now, two other things why you don't publish my article. Either I don't count, and I don't have the reason for that podium, or you don't want me to say what I say. If I'm wrong, you have my piece, and then let him respond. 1% of U.S. highest income people pay over 40% of the total U.S. taxes. 5% of the highest income people pay over 60% of all the U.S. taxes. 10% of the people pay 72% of all the taxes paid in this country. And the bottom 50% pays no taxes. Can you tell me how you will lower the taxes of people who already don't pay any taxes and receive a positive, uh, uh, a positive benefit? Oh, so there is... A, so but I cannot, so I stop, I stop writing and say, respond if you want, if you can, and so on. So I know something, but they don't. And that's the New York Times. That's the New York Times. Now, this is, of course, what's happening and what happened until June of this year. This is the, ha uh, the amount, this indicates risk. This is the yields on a 10-year bond, how much you have to pay interest to buy government bonds, over and above the German bond or bond. For, uh, for Spain, it used to be 2-3%. For Portugal, 7%. For Ireland, 8%. For Greece, 16%. That was before the, cup, the past couple of weeks, because this is what happened in the past couple of weeks, that now, what used, used to be Spain, 2%, it's become over 3%. Italy, what used to be 1.5%, now it's almost uh, 3%. Now, this is a lot, because if you add... This is the excess of the interest you have to, uh, to uh, pay on Spanish and Italian bonds over and above the German rate, which is about 2%. And now we know that if Italy, if this rate, therefore, it's 3 plus 2 is 5. If this rate goes to 4%, Italy can no longer and Spain can no longer manage their huge debt. 
And so that's where the crisis, that's where the crisis uh, uh, would come. So long and pain, painful economic research. Remember, Greece cannot do monetary policy. It's done by the European Central Bank, which is increasing interest rates from 1% to one and a quarter percent in April, to one and a half percent. It cannot do fiscal policy. They were cooking the books. Anyone, they were saying that the trade, the budget deficit was three, four percent. It wasn't five percent, it was 13, 14 percent. How much can you lie? And you people are, you people don't realize. Uh, uh, so you have, uh, and they cannot do exchange rate policy. Otherwise they could do devalue or allow the currency to depreciate. That means, the only thing they can do is to restructure their economy, increase productivity, and frankly, reduce wages. But that's all very difficult to do. But that is, in other words, and that burden is medium term, long term. Greece needs 10 years, 10 years to put its house in order. It doesn't have 10 years. And this is, uh, uh, this is uh, loans cannot be repaid without restructuring and need to restart uh, law with sh small. Look what France and Germany wanted to do under the French plan. They wanted to extend more loans or increase the, the, the maturity of the loans to Greece with high interest rates, which <laughs> it's unbelievable because they, wouldn't, they would never restructure, not grow for the next 20 years if that, uh, if that came through. But this is just the US budget deficit as a percentage of GDP. But look at our country. This is unbelievable. We thought we would never see this. A deficit of uh, over 11% in 2009, a, a, a deficit of 12%, 11% in uh, 2010, and the way it's going, it'll be 9%. We have never seen this. The US budget deficit in 2006 was 60% of GDP. Now it's over 100%. We used to regard any country that had 100% like Italy, like uh, now Greece and Japan, never mind, 200, 180%, uh, as unfit, as misguided, as living beyond their means. Now we are facing the same situation. This is really sad. This is really sad. But let's go to finish. Growth factors in advanced countries growth strategies in emerging markets, and what is the scenario that we have. If we look back, if you say, what were the reasons for growth in the past 30 years? We have to say there was deregulation, even though it got a bad name, we've had the wrong financial innovation. Now, how much did GDP fall in 2009? 2.6%. But how much did we grow? In other words, yes, we made excessive, we had the, law, the wrong things, but financial deregulation really, re innovation really helped. We went to extreme, to esoteric, to create the fault swaps. Those were the ones uh, that uh, 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 we were regarded as uh, what was, uh, was uh, 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 a weapon of mass destruction, <laughs> as Buffett uh, said. And IT. Information technology. These were the primary reasons, the fundamental reasons for growth and higher growth in the United States and Europe. Now, weaker in this decade, reduction in the US demand, I mean, they should now wish too much that the US succeeds in reducing the trade deficit because we had $600 billion, which was the demand of other countries. Activity, production of other countries. When we eliminate it or reduce it, that's how much their exports decline, and through the multiply, how much growth will be negatively affected. Yes, we'll have less deregulation, we were with that, and we'll have less financial, financial innovation. But there are positive growth sources, uh, no slowdown in the application of information technology, and the stimulus from rapid growth in emerging markets. I did contribute something too, but we don't have the time, if you have questions, on how to, how to uh, uh, change uh, uh, regulations for the financial sector. Let me say only one thing. <clears throat> the moment you tell me what is illegal, you are telling me that if I can invent something which is not specifically illegal, it's legal. Financial operators are brilliant. You close one avenue, they'll find ways around it. So you cannot anticipate 
any possibilities. If you try to, to have regulations which can look at all possibilities, it's failure. Because you cannot anticipate, they'll find ways around it. So now regulation, yes, you want some specific regulations, but have to be broad. Broad in the sense to leave something to interpretation and keep them under suspense. For example, if something is too risky, and how do you define too risky? I'll tell you how to define too risky. Uh, if something is too risky, you shouldn't do it. Too risky? When the head of AIG went to testify in front of Congress, they asked him, how do you price these credit default swaps? He was unable or unwilling to explain. If he was unwilling, it's because it was illegal what he was doing. If he was unable, you are pricing uh, something, a service, without knowing what is the worth of that service. So now you tell them, when you go to, there is a body which will interpret if you go to excesses. Keep them a bit under suspense, because there is no other way of, do, you cannot anticipate money is fungible. You close one avenue, you open others, but that's another, another matter. This is what is, uh, I was part of the OECD uh, on simulation. Of course, these are, <laughs> if it's garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> you have to make assumptions and these, but from, the best assumptions that we can make, growth is fairly, fairly moderate, fairly slow in all advanced countries. It is rapid, real rapid, in China and India. It is rapid, but not up to potential in the other large, in the other large countries, Russia, Brazil, uh, and uh, South Africa, Mexico, and, uh, Indonesia, and so on. So this is the way, and this is from the IMF, this is not my figure, but this is China. The percentage of China of world GDP. In 2010, it was 10%. In 2030, the expectation is 22% and exceeding that of the US. This is Asia, the GDP of Asia, as a percentage of world GDP in 2010, uh, uh, prices. This was in 2010, and this is the G7, the rich countries, uh, the United States, Japan, Germany, France, England, Italy, and Canada. So notice in 2010, all of Asia was half of the G7. In 2030, it will be bigger than the G10. And finally, this is what China is uh, the relation. This is the percentage of world GDP of the United States, in 2001, imagine, 10 years ago, it was 22, 23%. It is declining to, by 2016, at least the projection of the, uh, of the IMF, to 18. China was maybe 6, 7% is rising. So China, and China legitimately, China was the major country in the world. And it is only reoccupying its position it had in the past. It works hard, it saves, it works intelligently. We have nothing, we wish them well. The problem is that, uh, the problem is that even when this occurs, remember, China's population is 1.34 billion, 1,342 million. The United States is 3 million. So even when the total GDP is the same, the per capita income of China will still be three and a half, four times less than that of the United States. But it's a tremendous achievement. We have never seen, we have never seen any country grow so rapidly for such a long time. We can have Korea that can grow seven, eight, nine percent for a few years. I was in China, everybody goes to China now. I was in China the first time, 1987 to Fudan University for the National Academy of Sciences. I saw a, 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 a notion of bicycles and no cars. Now you see a notion of cars and no bicycles. The incredible thing that happened is just unbelievable, unbelievable. And China deserves only to retake its position as a major world country. We have no qualms with that. We have no qualms with that. Uh, there are, of course, nations that are afraid of, but there wasn't written in stone that the U.S. had to be forever the top, top country. We hope that uh, uh, China will use its influence, its power, constructively, as constructively of more than what the United States uh, uh, has done, and we hope so. But the United States, with all the mistakes it made, with all the mistakes it made, 
that, that man, have you ever seen a country that wins a world war and helps those countries that have been beaten to reconstruct? Never. You have to go back to the Roman Empire to find a country that wins a world war and helps those countries to rebuild. Someone in Europe said, well, this was a selfish way. Of course, it's in our interest also. It's better to have, it's better to have a, a strong democratic Europe than a communist Europe. We could have stopped the European Union. I guarantee, I'm old enough to know. All we had to do is to tell France and Germany, we have a free trade agreement between the two of us. And the, the United States knew perfectly well that with a united Europe, it would give more competition to Europe, but we accepted the challenge. We say it's better to have a more competitive, a richer, and a more democratic uh, Europe than to have, any, uh, to have a, a, a dictatorship uh, uh, of Europe. And you know what I tell our friends? Why did Russia fall? There was no invasion. There was no nothing. Russia fell because its economy collapsed. And the proof of it is not my data. When the Berlin Wall came down, the total GDP of Russia, the total value of goods and services produced by Russia, a country, Russia, not the Soviet Union, Russia, a country of 148 million people, was less than the GDP of little Netherlands, 14 million people. Which meant that this great power had a per capita income 10 times less. They could go on the moon, but their per capita income was 10 times less than Western Europe. That's what the non-market did. And so what happened now? China liberalized the economic system, and we hope gradually also the political system, and grew rapidly. Russia did the reverse, liberalized to some extent the political system, but not the economic system, and it is not growing. <laughs> and this is, uh, so the final conclusion, unfortunately, in a sense for us, is that slow growth in advanced countries due to deep structural uh, imbalances, some of which we deserve, because we want to do the same thing, as I've said, Clinton and Obama are telling us specifically that we want to be more like Europe, yes, and not grow. Uh, and the financial crisis and structural disequilibrium resulted in profound shifts in the, world in the world economic order from the G7 to G20 with rising importance of China. So I stop here and thank you. I talk too much, but we will. Uh, <laughs>